Okay, so um, my name's Jim Lindsay, and I'm a researcher with RHEL Midwest and RHEL Southwest. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the methods that we've used to, to study the broader topic of teacher supply and demand. Also highlight the overlap in methods for studying teacher mobility and uh, supply and demand. As state education agencies track progress on their equity plans, one aspect of those plans is whether uh, students have equal access to effective teachers. That is part of the impetus for studying teacher supply and demand and educator mobility. Uh, what states are finding is that some subject areas and regions within states uh, there are insufficient numbers of certified teachers to provide instruction given the student-teacher ratios that the districts prefer. Uh, they're also finding that educators transfer from school to school in predictable ways. The bulk of this presentation will focus on the simple and complex methods of uh, studying teacher supply and demand. And we've used these methods for studies conducted for RHEL Midwest, for RHEL Southwest, but also in states including Massachusetts, Oklahoma, and soon Michigan. In most states, teacher shortages have been picked up by various news outlets. And this is certainly true in all of the states that RHEL Midwest serves. So here's an example of a headline from Wisconsin. Uh, and it's mentioned in newspapers, blogs, television, as seen here in Illinois. Uh, in Indiana as well. And in Ohio and Iowa. Uh, there have been headlines in Minnesota as well, as the State Department of Education publishes a supply and demand report every other year. And our next presenter, Elia Brueggemann from Minnesota Department of Education, will talk more about the supply and demand situation in their state. There's also Michigan, and RHEL Midwest is currently conducting a study of teacher supply, demand, and shortages in collaboration with the Midwest Alliance for Improving Teacher Preparation. And that alliance is centered in Michigan. So if policymakers aren't informed directly by their state education agency about the teacher staffing patterns within their state, the headlines from the news outlets will make them ask questions such as these that appear on this slide. So um, are they a problem in my state? Are shortages pervasive or localized? And why isn't the educator pipeline working? Some of our work has focused on highlighting data sources and analytic methods that state education agencies can use to answer questions like this. We found that states and researchers tend to take two general approaches to determining if there are teacher shortages. Uh, first, they can take the more labor intensive approach by first calculating how many teachers will be needed given expected enrollments and that is referred to as teacher demand. It's on the left part of this slide. Um, and they also calculate the numbers of teachers that are coming from various supply sources. That is uh, teacher supply over on the right side of this, this figure. School administrators have been calculating teacher demand for years. Uh, it's uh, basically the number of students divided by the preferred student-teacher ratio. So that takes care of the left side of, the, uh, of this figure. Um, to determine the teacher supply, you basically calculate all of the teachers coming from all of the various sources. Uh, most of the supply sources can come from data that states already collect. So the major source of teachers in a given year are those who continue teaching from, year, from the year before. Uh, the percent of teachers who continue teaching from year to year is the retention rate, of course. Uh, to assess this, uh, we typically look at the staffing data for a number of years and record the numbers of teachers who appear in the data for the same schools in consecutive years. Uh, looking at educator mobility involves a similar approach, only you look at whether these educators 
who appear in the staffing data for consecutive years remain at the same school each year. There's also the teachers from traditional teacher preparation programs. Uh, there are a number of ways uh, and data sources that you can look at uh, to look at these trends. Uh, you could look at the number of teaching certificates issued each year. Uh, you can even go back a step and determine if the numbers uh, determine the numbers of program completers each year. Finally, you can merge the annual staffing data and certific certification data and see the numbers of new inexperienced teachers who take a teaching position each year. Likewise, uh, the same process can be followed for teachers from alternative uh, teacher preparation programs. Okay, let's see. Um, one supply source is often called the reserve pool, which is the group of certified teachers who are willing and able to teach, but who are not. Uh, there's no easy way to assess this uh, supply source, except by looking at the numbers of teachers who leave their positions one year and do not appear in the staffing data for some amount of time, but then reappear later. And finally, you could look at the numbers of teachers who come from other states. Uh, this can be measured by merging staffing data with cer certification data. Uh, usually states have a dis distinct mechanism for out-of-state teachers to become certified in their state. Uh, usually this is uh, a special code that's on teacher certificates, and it's also in the, the certificate databases. And as uh, Yin Mei Wan, my colleague, mentioned a few uh, minutes ago, um, we have found that uh, this source of teachers, the teachers who are in, migrating in from other states, this tends to be the, the, um, the smallest set of teachers that get hired in state, states each year. So thus far, we've been talking about the labor-intensive approach to looking at teacher supply and demand. Uh, shortages exist if the numbers of teachers coming through the supply channels is insufficient for the number of teachers needed. But for many states, there's uh, a quick and easy indicator that indicates shortage, and that's the number of emergency permits or waivers or certificates that are issued each year. Uh, you'll recall that a previous presenter, uh, Robin Miller from Oklahoma, used this data source to indicate the extent of shortage that her state is experiencing. There's another indicator though, and that is the results of a survey of local school districts about the difficulty they experience in finding teachers in particular subject areas. That is the approach that Elia Brueggemann and her colleagues in Minnesota take as part of the biennial teacher supply and demand study. And Robin Miller, also mentioned uh, she showed some findings from a survey of districts as well. Um, so I, I've gone through a lot of technical information pretty quickly, and, um, and there are resources uh, that have been published through the RHEL uh, that uh, address these topics, and I encourage you to, uh, to download them and uh, Read them if you need more information. Thank you very much. Take me on. Hello, I am Elia Brueggemann, and I am going to go through a presentation from Minnesota. So just reflecting on the research <clears throat> that was done for Minnesota and the perspective that we do have here in the state. As you all know, we also are working on an ESA plan where um, districts will create, districts will create and update plans to ensure low-income students, students of color, and American Indian students have access to effective experience and in-field teachers. 
In addition, the plan will improve students' access to teachers of colors and American Indian teachers. So alphabet supply and demand report is mandated by a state law in Minnesota. Uh, we work with Ariel Midwest Research to, uh, to take a look at the numbers and percentages of teachers of color and American Indian teachers that we do have in the state. So uh, the, the 2015 report was the first time we report the information to the public. Because of this information, school organizations and advocacy organizations, as well as legislations or legislators began to focus on the lack of diversity in the teacher workforce and they became to, to, to introduce uh, legislation and strategies to increase teachers of color in Minnesota so that other students of color have access to educators that look like them. So as you can see from the data displayed here, this is um, actually uh, is showing the, the teacher that we have compared to the future uh, students of color that we will have in the state. Uh, so the enrollments, uh, historical enrollments for Minnesota, most students are white. However, by the research, we see that our students of colors are growing by a large uh, percentage in Minnesota. So then in legislation for the 2017 year, the, uh, the legislation set up some funding for the Department of Education. Some funding was established in the Grow Your Own Grants, which is a million and a half per year that we can access to school districts to uh, create pathway for secondary school students students of colors and American Indian students, as well as for paraprofessionals, so that they have, there is a collaboration between the university, which will have a non-traditional teacher program, so that those grants will go towards the tuition for those paraprofessionals, or also to create classes at the secondary school for students of color and American Indian students to go into teaching. Another grant is a collaborative urban and greater Minnesota educators. There is another million in here for, um, for paraprofessionals to, ha to have access to pathway for teaching and this funding goes to the universities. We also have the Minnesota Indian teacher training program and also the Southwest Minnesota University para paraprofessional program, which is for a special education teacher pathway. So there is other legislative programs that we do have that were passed in 2017, such as grants to teacher candidates, which was to higher education, and I believe there is about 3 million there. There is teacher, for, teacher shortage loan forgiveness if they are teaching in a priority or focus school. We also have some hiring bonuses as part of the Grow Your Own for the alternative pay system. And as probably many other states, we have the Brookings funds for uh, rural career education in the consortiums. And this year, we also set up some funding to an organization which is called the African American Registry to train teachers who are, uh, or students who are seniors into their teaching career on cultural competency. This is a pilot that we do have, and the, the, the funding is, is going to be to work with two universities so that we can train our teachers before they actually go into the districts on cultural competency. Now, Deb is going to be going over other legislative, um, you know, that was passed so that about, about licensure. Hi everyone, I'm Debbie O'Dell. I'm the Interim Director in um, Educator Licensing. We currently, under Educator Licensing, are with the Minnesota Department of Education. Our department works closely with the Minnesota Board of Teaching. Uh, the difference is the Minnesota Board of Teaching um, is responsible for developing the Teacher Code of Ethics. Uh, they adopt the rules for um, licensing of public school teachers and um, also the rules for approving teacher preparation programs. They also handle our te teacher ethics. Um, 
our teacher ethics issues um, regarding revoking or um, denying a license based on those qualifying grounds. In licensing, our responsibilities are issuing and denying the license applications for general ed and special ed. And also, um, we work with verifying the districts and charter school licensure compliance. Um, what's happening is beginning January 1st of 2018, the Educator Licensing Department and the Board of Teaching will be combining to a new state agency called the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board. Uh, we will become one state agency. However, um, the, the third board uh, evolved, the Minnesota Board of School Administrators, will be kept separate from that. So we will actually contract with the Board of School Administrators to issue administrative licensing. Another big change we saw with our last legislative session is effective July 1st of 2018, Minnesota is moving into a tiered licensure structure. Um, what that does is it puts licensure candidates into one of four tiers, uh, depending on their licensure requirements. Uh, the tier one and tier two uh, license will require a district to have a job offer. Uh, the tier three requirement is a three-year license that's renewable indefinitely um, and, and basically is a full professional teaching license. The tier four requirements are similar to the tier three, except the tier four um, also requires passing of a basic skills test and three years of teaching experience in Minnesota. Um, the tier four license is renewable um, is, is a five-year license and that's renewable indefinitely as long as the candidate has met the renewal requirements. Um, some other, some other um, licensing changes that we saw with the legislative session, um, our ABS license used to require that the candidate um, secure another special ed license within five years if they didn't already. So they would have to get an EBD or an LD, a DD license within five years of the issuance of the ABS license. We call that an anchor license. Um, by, or as of September 1st of 2017, that is no longer required. Um, there's some, some exemption for career and tech um, instructors and then um, we are going to take a look at our special education licenses to determine if we have a cross categorical license we can offer. Uh, future plans for Minnesota to retrain uh, and actually uh, recruit and induct potential teachers of color by, we're going to be focusing on the existing funding that we do have, such as our integration funding, which we have over $100 million that is going to the school districts. And pathway to teaching, we're looking at being a systematic program for our high school students, where we, we will be working with the universities to create about three or four courses in our high schools with 30% or more students of color, so that we can put them into their pathway to, uh, to grow your own. Um, through the regional centers of excellence, also we're going to be forming teacher committees in rural areas to take a look at the need statewide for teachers of color. 